we stand for the words of our King. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from Luke chapter 10, select verses. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go to its streets and say, Even the dust of your town be wiped from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So far, our text. Please be seated. Your Christian friends, it was just a couple months ago now that we had different graduations at our colleges and seminaries. And uh, there were 125, Lauren, you can put up the first slide, go on my, my, my clicker. There we go. And uh, there are 27 graduates. It doesn't sound like a lot. Because as the boomers retire, that number is closer to 70 boomers retiring every year. So that's just how life goes in sociology and birth trends. Well, there were 125 graduates from MLC. That's better, you might say, yes. Well, there were 116 churches that did not get teachers. Schools, excuse me, that did not get teachers. Now, that is a little disheartening until you understand that there are other church bodies where the vacancy rate is rapidly approaching 20%, and we have the new crack 10 yet. Now, I praise my God for all of those blessings. But I also think it's worth spending time on the portion of Scripture where our Lord talks about public ministry and where they came from and how it all works together. My friends, we go forward under the theme, The Lord Says Go, because it is Christ who calls ministers. They go with a prayer. They go with his strength alone. They go with the message of peace. And they go with his authority. You can take off the, the graduates there. The prayer request by Jesus is a surprising to some. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And it kind of, you almost want to stop Jesus and say, Jesus, do you not know where they come from? Do you not know that we need them? Why are you telling us to pray about it? Well, the reason, and we're going to hit this a little bit harder in our Bible study too, the reason why you pray is not because God needs to hear your prayers. We need to pray. We are the ones who need to ask God. I've said before, this isn't necessarily a sermon 
on prayer, and then this little section of it is, prayer is not bending God's will to yours. Prayer is how you bend your will to God's. I know that's a deep thought, but the longer time you spend with prayer and wrestling with your God and hearing Him speak to you in His Word, that's the reality. <laughs> that's what prayer is. The reason why we pray and why Jesus told his disciples to pray, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are, are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We do that so that when God does bless us, so that when God does send workers into the harvest field, we remember the same thing. We remember where they come from. Because God sends pastors into churches whether the people want them or not. So often the people around here don't understand what our ministry of our church is. That's okay. We can tell them. Some may still not like it, but that's beside the point. That's not why we're here. We go with a prayer. <coughs> and we go in his strength alone. This is what he says will happen. I'm sending you out like lambs <coughs> among wolves. Uh, I had a professor who told us when we were seniors at the seminary that he was going to send us out to the wolves. And he had this passage in mind when he said, when he said that. And he said, gentlemen, when you get to your churches, you're going to find out very quickly that they're really just sheep. And you can pull up the next slide there. They're kind of cute and fluffy. We've done a whole sermon series on sheep and how, well, they're not that bright. Sometimes they get stuck. There's a video I showed you where it jumps into the ditch, right? And then the kid pulls it out of the ditch and he jumps right back in the ditch again. <laughs> it's just wonderful. It's just a, such a picture of me. Well, um, I went to uh, a convention for our district. It was kind of a momentous one because we elected a new district president. And you might say, well, so what? Well, those district presidents work for our church body. And one of the first things that they tell them is that you have to grieve the loss of your ministry because... If I went there, if I was elected to district president, I would now be your, your part-time pastor. So I'd, be, I'd be traveling 50%. The nice thing is, is that the church body gives the church another pastor for free. Because they just took me from me. And the man that we elected is Mike Seifert. He's a classmate of mine. He's a great guy. And after he was elected, he walked up front and brilliant. And he stood before them and he said, if you could only see my heart, you never would have elected me. As I stand here before you, I think, I hope they like my speech. <laughs> and that hit me so hard because I don't know that I, until today, when I, I told myself when this came up, I would accept it. If you only would have seen my heart, you would have gone to the district president and said, don't send this friend. Because I'm selfish. I can be lazy. All of those things are wrapped into it. And yet when I was sitting in seminary, I didn't know what I had to know. And when the professor said, I'm sending you out into the wolves, it, it's a little overwhelming at first when you realize that you're a shepherd. <laughs> I had a compromise. Compromise are so dangerous because... They're at that age where they're, they're, they're pretty bright. And they start to ask intelligent questions. And one of them said, what if you preach a sermon and you say something wrong and that's the last time anyone can hear the gospel and they, they end up being lost forever in hell? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Confirmation. Yeah, that's possible. And yet, I go out in his strength alone. Because it doesn't depend on my heart. God doesn't call. He equips, of course. He equips the call. And he gives me what I have all, always needed in every situation to minister. And so, as I go out among the sheep, it's fun. I love it. And I am so thankful for my job. We go with prayer, we go in his strength alone, and we go with a message of peace. 
piece um, you could take off off the sheet. As we get together at conference, one of the neat things about it is we get to support each other as pastors because once in a while you feel like you're on an island. I, I have never felt like that. Number one, I talk to my two brothers frequently. The one of them the work schedule is not as conducive as mine. The other one is more free at this time. And I talk to him probably every, every, every day. And it's awesome. I also talk to my, to my brothers in the ministry. We bounce things off. Tom Parsley is my elder. And I talk to him a lot too. And I am blessed with a wonderful support staff in ministry. And all of you are keenly aware of how little I do here when it comes to ministry. I preach and teach. I know that. But so many of the volunteers... Do so much. It's amazing. Well, one of the things you talk about is the people that we in interact with. And it is a challenge. And I know sometimes it can be scary. Well, have you ever met people? Pull up the next picture. Have you ever met a Neil Pagan? Um, there's a lot of them. Once upon a time, they used to call them Wicca. Now they're just Neo Pagans. Um, and this article was written to libraries and how they can serve this emerging portion of the population. Now, there's nothing wrong with a public library serving the neo pagans of the world. That's what libraries are supposed to do, I guess. But that just floored me that this is a demographic that has moved the needle, and they exist. I've already shared with you that about 10% of my daughter's class at their school um, identifies as LGBTQIA+. And I know the temptation for some of us is to belittle that, but please do not, because it won't help your cause as you minister to them, as you speak the truth in love. As I told my daughters, the suicide attempt rate is around 50% going forward for the rest of their lives. And to just be so very careful, and to be respectful, because that is the best way to gain an audience for our Lord. Because the gospel is powerful. When we went there, there, when I went to the conference, this was actually a few years ago, he talked to a young woman who had been wicked, and he kind of broke a little bit deeper. Because on the surface, it doesn't matter if the person is a neo-pagan, LGBTQ, or Lutheran, or Methodist. There's talk of the Methodist church body splitting, and you maybe heard me say that in the previous week. But there could be people in the same boat who just feel lost. I don't care what you identify as or your background is, anyone can feel lost. And to just be aware of that and to show respect to them. Well, this message of peace is so simple. Do you understand that Jesus only gave his disciples a few words to speak? He said, when you go to a house, peace to this house. The next sermon theme is, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That's it. Now, they could have said more, of course, but that's the sum total of theology they went out with. They, again, probably said more. But understand, I think we psych ourselves out when we try to speak to people, don't we? You, you don't need to say much. Just offer hope. So this colleague that I was talking to meets the Neil Pagan, and he sits down and just drills a little bit deeper and says, well, tell me about your family. She said, it's really hard. My parents are divorced. They don't get along. I don't like being at home because it's just constant fighting. And she just kind of went on and he kind of stopped her and he said, what if you could start over? What if you could be born again and just do it, just try to engulf the call of right? And she kind of said, I just wish that was possible. Well, it is possible, is it not? Isn't that what we do in baptism? You're born again of water and the Spirit? I am so proud of our family of believers that is a family that supports each other. And frankly, if you're watching online, it's awesome, but that's one of the weaknesses with just watching online is you don't get to support people. You don't get to support the people around you, and you don't get the opportunity to support them. And that's okay. I know that we can't always be here. Especially during COVID, this was an enormous blessing. But as you are able, I encourage you to go talk to people in person. Social media is a blessing, I think, overall. But there's nothing that can take that place of the 
personal interaction, of being in the same room with someone, is really important, especially as we do gospel ministry. Well, if you take off the name of Megan, <laughs> we go with prayer, we go with his strength alone, we go with a message of peace, we go with his authority. And I, this is almost the exact same topic, but I want you to say, okay, so now you're at the grocery store and you walk up to someone who is whatever, fill in the blank of the person that you wouldn't really would like to talk to, or worse, your friend comes up to you and says, Hey, I just joined the Neil Pagan call. Your response is, Lauren, can you push to the next slide? Have you seen Maverick? It's a really good movie. Because you don't really want to talk about it. You just want to run away screaming, right? Because it's scary. You can take off Maverick. I, I, I'm probably the only person in the room who hasn't seen it yet. But yeah. You have a nice job, right? Well, so... But isn't that our reaction? That's my reaction sometimes. I'm like, oh man, I really gotta go do something else. But yeah, you go with God's authority. You never have to wonder, what right do I have to walk in this person's life? Because I'm gonna tell you, Jesus is the greatest agent for change the world has ever seen. It is dangerous to bring up Jesus in a conversation. You should still do it, do it by all means. But understand, you have your Lord's authority to come into that person's life and change it. And I know sometimes it feels like you're beating a head, your head against a wall. Did you listen to the first lesson from Ezekiel? I will make your forehead hardened. Hardened like flint. Because I'm not sending you to people who don't speak your language. They didn't listen to you. I'm sending you to Israel. And they won't. You will feel like you're beating your head against a wall. But God makes your head harder. And you go... Do you understand that you are those 72? You're the answer to that prayer. You don't have to be a public minister. I tried to hit that hard in the, in the children's message. To reach out with the gospel. Because your words are powerful, just like mine are. Just like your Lord's are. That's the truth. And finally, I have to say, you don't need to wait for an inner calling. I never had one. You don't need to wait for a sign above. There was no lightning bolt. And you don't have to think twice. I became a pastor. I never answered the kids when I said, why did I, why, why did I become a pastor? I became a pastor because I thought it was one way that I could serve my God. It sounds kind of weak, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And thinking back to middle school and high school days, I didn't become an electrical engineer because I told myself I didn't want to sit in front of the computer screen the rest of my life. Do you know what I do now? <laughs> Half my job is writing. <laughs> and I like that part too. It's just amazing what you think at one time and then what you end up doing. You have no idea. It's so hard. But that's what was going through my head. And that's the path. And I know that my God had a hand in it. But there was nothing magical about it. And yet I know that he answered the prayers of people when I became a pastor. Including my own. Because it's hard when you're young and you don't know what you want to do. Well, if you can pull up the last slide. I, I just have to bring this up. And uh, on second look, those are not tablets. Those are chalkboards. But... That's the old school tablet, wasn't it? There are some empty classrooms. And that's even true in the public school system. But it's doubly true in our church body. Those 140 teaching vacancies uh, that were filled by those graduates, there's still 116 empty classrooms. And the question that I have is almost irritation. I said, well, what do you do about that? How do you have 20 kids and no teacher?" And you kind of, well, you make it work. You combine two classrooms, that's not ideal. If you go to MLC, you're going to see the smart kids get pulled out early as an emergency teacher, as a sophomore in college, or a junior in college. They usually let the seniors graduate because at some point you have to. And that's what they do. 
because there's no other option. Same thing is true of churches. You just kind of double up. You're a vacancy pastor. Some of those guys who have retired do step in and do an empty pulpit, kind of, sort of. But it's not the same. It's not the same as having someone who will sit with people and cry with them and pray with them and go fishing with them. Those are all really important things as you get to know your people so you can minister to them. And so this is a hard plug if you are a young lady or gentleman and you're thinking, what can I do with my life? Please do consider being a pastor or teacher in our church body. It is wonderful. You will make more money doing something else. And yet I have to tell you, I have never been in law. Sorry, Bethel Lutheran Church has taken care. My God has taken care of all my needs. And I am so thankful for the life that he's given me. <coughs> Dear friends, Christ calls ministers. When the Lord says go, we go with prayer. We go in his strength alone. We go with the message of peace. We go with his authority. Now you go with his word.